All right, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so I'm Richard, and so I'm with Let's Go Learn, and Let's Go Learn is the makers of Dora and Adam. So have you all done your Dora and Adam testing already? Yes. Yeah? Great. I do want to, I'm going to give you a little background about the assessments, because one thing is all of you have never really had the Dora and, and Adam training, which tells you how to look at the data. Here's the first quiz of the day. A and I, what do you think that stands for in the context of, of what we're talking about today? What is it? Could be. We're, I'm thinking assessment and instruction. Okay? So, but those are good, good, good guesses. So if we look at this here, notice the little arrows right here. The A and the I, we have these two arrows. So this is the model we're sort of following is that assessment instruction, it's a continuous cycle. You assess, you instruct, you reassess, you evaluate. Now, if we look at assessment, there's two types of assessments I want to point out. There's accountability, summative assessment, and then there's diagnostic and formative. What do you think would be an example of an accountability assessment? Anyone, any guess? Something you do at the end of the year that people grumble about? <laughs> yeah, it could be it could be that. It could be also I'm thinking like NJ Ask or Parks. Right? So those are definitely accountability assessments. Those are assessments designed to take data, roll it up by school, and do comparisons. What we're gonna talk about too is is Dora falls into the area of diagnostic. Okay? Now the formative, here's something that's sort of interesting. The definition of a formative assessment is anything that informs instruction. So it could be as simple as, I ask a student, tell me the ABCs. If they don't know the ABCs, then I know, okay, they don't know it. So it could be as something as simple as a little quiz, but if something informs instruction, then that's considered formative, right? And so that is the realm where we, we're going to be um, talking about today. Now the other piece I want to mention is standards. Notice how standards are on the outside of this box? That's because standards are really not a part of the model. They're, they're the expectation. They're what we're striving to achieve. So there's something important to, to remember. Standards are not necessarily a, a model of assessment. It's where we're striving to go. But as teachers, you're going to figure out how can I get the students to meet the standards. Okay? And that's, that's where Dora and Adam hopefully is going to help you. So what's unique about Let's Go Learn? Let's Go Learn answers the question of why. Why is a student struggling or why are they doing well? Right? As a teacher, when someone struggles in reading or math, you want to know why. Sometimes in math, it could be, it could even be a reading issue, right? A lot of math involves reading word problems. On the, on the state test, the parks, there's going to be word problems. A lot of the problems are very, very complicated. They want to see the highest level of understanding. And so, Again, that's why we, we need diagnostic data to figure this out. So just two more slides about models and then we're going to move on. So standards model of assessment here, if we look at this, a standards model will look at a grade level sliver and this is just reading. So what we're saying here is, here, fourth grade, a standards model will tell you whether a student is above, at, or below. But it really doesn't tell you much more than that. And also a lot of standards assessments are all going to cover like in reading, it may just cover comprehension and vocabulary. But a diagnostic model of assessment, which Dora follows, we adapt, regardless of the, of the student's grade. So if, even if you have an eighth grader, we're going to adapt up and down because it's a computer adaptive assessment until we find a student's instructional point. So in Dora, if you have an eighth grader, we're not testing eighth graders in phonics or sight words anymore, right? On the NJAS or the parks, they're just giving passages and vocabulary. But on our assessment, we say, okay, there's some kind of decoding issue, if we have to, we'll ratchet all the way down to uh, beginning sounds to find out what their instructional point is. So our assessments will adapt to find instructional points. Does that make sense? Okay. It's very different because a lot of assessments don't. A lot of people love to test standards. They love to say, oh, the student missed the standards, teach them the standard. But we have to say, is, look, if my whole class is below the standard or if my pacing guide says I'm supposed to teach at fifth grade, you know, multiplying mixed numbers fractions, if I realize 75% of my class is at recognizing fractions with like denominators, then I can't teach that, right? And we have hard data that will help you break those groups up. Yes? Does 
Is that why it seems as though the students are taking the same type problems over and over and over again? You mean in Adam? In or? Adam, yeah. It's like well, doing place value, it seems like they just take a place value, place value, place value, and then it'll eventually change. Yes. I mean, that's part, yeah, that's part of it. Part of it is in Adam, just so you know, we try to be real accurate. So when I tell you that someone is at um, short vowel, we don't give you one item. We want to be sure. So we, give, we work in sets. So when we do place value, you're right, we give somebody um, three to five items at maybe hundreds, mm -hmm. and then we say, ah, oh, they got it. Then we jump up to thousands. Then we jump up to 10,000. Then we say, ah, oh, they can't get 10,000. So then we find out, okay, their instructional point is 1,000 to 10,000. That's what we do is we go up and down. Now math, I'm going to show you later, math is, is 44 subtests. Dora in reading is seven or six or seven subtests, but math is so skills based, it's very broad and we're going to look at that. You'll see that. All right, so here's another thing that's real interesting. Test bias. So I want to mention this real quickly. As you assess your students, you're giving them all different sorts of assessments. It's important that you understand test bias. Right? So this is an old assessment. It's sort of interesting. Look at this thing right here. It says listening comprehension. Look at that first row up there, the first uh, line right there. What do you think is potentially biased about this assessment? This is supposed to be a listening comprehension assessment. I think, do you think kids know what these pictures are? Yeah, it's a safety pin. <laughs> Or, yeah. Oh, okay. So, so you're right. Just as you guys struggled, the thing about tests are that there's a lot of cultural bias, right? This is an old assessment. We like showing old assessments because then you really see it. This is back in the day when they assumed that everyone sewed at home. Well, I doubt even back then everyone. Maybe they did, but today they certainly don't all sew at home, right? So it's interesting. So when you get a lot of assessments today, a lot of them have cultural bias, or there's. So you need to. Not even just cultural bias, there's bias in assessment. So when you administer Dora and Adam, there's going to be bias. And, and when you administer Parks, and I'll give you an example. When you administer a computer assessment, what does that assume? It assumes mouse skills, right? It assumes computer skills, mouse skills. So that's potentially biased too. If somebody doesn't know how to use the mouse because some of the new kindergartners and first graders, they're all used to touch screen devices. So, so actually in some sense it's sort of interesting something is rolling back. So we have to make sure students know how to use the mouse if we want to have an accurate assessment. Now, Dora, on our, on our, you're not doing younger kids, but there's a mouse practice section as well. So it's just little things like that. Here's one more passage. Read this passage real quickly. This is from the Scholastic Reading Inventory, which is a common Lexile assessment used today. What do you think is a potential bias in that passage if one of your students from your school was reading that? So you would have had to know what it's like to be on the beach or you know, know what it is to be. Sure. This one is to know what it means. To see, you're right. I agree. I'm from California. I'm from the Bay Area, Berkeley. It's right by the Bay. You go to a Berkeley school, you ask kids if they've been to the beach, 75% of them haven't been to the beach. It's probably very similar here. So they may not know what choppy water looks like, right? The other thing is this assumes this student is, this person is flying, I believe. We last class we were like, are they in a boat or are they flying? There's a lot of experience that is assumed in this. Orlando, that you know that Orlando is in Florida. That's somewhere far away, right? So it's interesting. A lot of tests we give, there's a lot of bias in it. And as a result, we say we're testing something, but it's really testing something else, okay? All right, so I am going to, um, I'm going to talk about Dora now. So Dora is the reading assessment. Now, I know some of you are math teachers, but you have access to both sets of data, and it's a good thing for you to be able to understand the Dora test too, because when your students struggle in science or in math, you should look at the reading score. If their vocabulary is really low, or if their, their reading comprehension is low, that tells you something about them that, you know, it may not be a science issue. Right, so, so that's why I, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this as well. All right, so, so let's continue then. Uh, the Dora subtests. Okay, so these are the seven subtests and most of you are familiar with it, hopefully. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and actually explain these and that way we'll cover what we talked about, the comprehension, the nature of the comprehension measure. So the first one is high frequency words. 
Now high frequency words, uh, this of course is the, the interface is separate from the items, right? So that means that uh, an older student, the interfaces go from K3, which are going to be the animal themed, and then we have the four to seven, which is the in between, not animals, but not no frills, and then of course eighth grade and above is there's no avatar, no creatures, really simple. Okay, so let me explain high frequency words. This is testing an immediate ID of high frequency words, so the student would hear the, and they have to click, so the, click, a, click. If they take over three and a half seconds, it's actually incorrect. Okay, because what we want to make sure is they're not that they're not trying to decode it. These are words that they're supposed to immediately know what they are and click on it. All right? So just be aware, what is a potential confound on the subtest? Meaning something that could throw the score off. What's, what are we doing here? Awesome. Yeah. It's a little over three seconds. I mean, it's actually maybe closer to four, but you're right. The mouse, if somebody has a hard time with the mouse, that could be absolutely a confound, right? They clicked the wrong one by mistake. That's true. For me, I know it's difficult to hear. Sure, if it's difficult to hear. Those are all compounds. We'll look at your data. I mean, in general, in practice, it's fair, it seems like it's fairly reliable. We don't see, you know, when we look at kids who sometimes will have a low high frequency words, but a higher another one, it seems to make sense in general. Um, but absolutely, if you know you have bad headphones, or you know that some students are having a hard time. Kindergarten, absolutely, that's the beginning. Nowadays, a lot of kindergartners, they don't have such good mouse skills, they have tablet skills, right? There is a transition happening. There is, on the login page, there is a mouse practice button. Okay, I'll show that to you. So I think it's for younger kids, absolutely. One time, go in the lab, it's do mouse practice, and they should just practice clicking, right? Gives them a little dexterity. And you know, you know kids, one time for 15, 20 minutes, they, they pick it up. Unless they're physio uh, physiologically a reason for them, like they're just having motor skill issues, then that's different, right? Okay, so just be aware of that. And this one, it goes up to high third grade, the score. The next one is word recognition. So this one, you see the slightly different interface. This is the grades four through um, seven. Now this one is untimed, and the scores go up to 12th grade. So what happens is once students tend, uh, these words are out of context, so once someone tends to nail down decoding, the score will go up. You may see some of your students around third, fourth, fifth grade, once they really nail down decoding, their scores will shoot up. Okay? Have you seen that? Somebody? Any fourth or fifth grade teachers? I see my first graders, the ones who can decode, this. do really well on mm -hmm. this because they sit there a really long time and move their finger across and sound out easy. Oh, I see. Each one, it's because they know this. I mean, it takes them a long time, but they do well because they... They know it, yeah. Okay, well, that's this. So again, it's just now that you know the nature of it, there's no timing, it makes sense that students... And the first one, where high frequency words, we tell them, go as quickly as you can, right? So that their instructions are, this section is timed. All right, next... Yes. You're right. This is not necessarily a fluency test. And, and I, I agree with you. You could have some students who are so tenacious that they just want to get every single word right. So their score, in that particular case, you're, you could have a high score when, you, when in reality you think they still struggle with decoding. But then what happens is you're going to see a low high frequency word score, right, potentially. So let's say you have a student where they're not a very good decoder, but they can figure it out. So then out of the two scores, you'll probably see a low high frequency words, but you'll see a high, uh, but maybe a high word rec. So in that case, that tells you something. Right, so that's why it's nice to have both those measures. Unless, of course, you just have a student maybe who is around the third grade who just really knows their high frequency words, but they never really were taught or focused on the other words other than high frequency words, right? Because, you know, those are all first through third grade words. They're just not the high frequency words. So, again, it's, and I've seen schools. One time I was on a call with the school district, and I said, you know, it's really unusual your data. A lot of your younger students have very strong high frequency words, but their word rec skills are very low. I said, I'm, that's actually pretty unusual. And there was like a dead silence on the phone. <coughs> and if there was a debate in the school about really focusing on high frequency words. In the past few years, they focused so much on high frequency words, they forgot about the other words, right? And so they actually had this, this flip in, this, in their, their data. They had good high frequency words, but all the other words were low. So anyway, it, I sort of stumbled on that in my call, but it's, it's interesting what can happen. Okay, so, so phonics, 
high, this goes from K through high fourth grade. Um, this particular one is NAP. There's a, it's testing short vowel. And then the student is untimed. We use half of the words are real words, half of the target words are nonsense words. Now, for elementary, it's not such a big deal, but when you start getting into secondary, so middle school and high school, students with high word rec, if you don't use nonsense words, then, we, then they get everything right if they're real words, because they just know all the words. So the, what happens is you'll end up seeing on the sheet that their errors are with non-words. Does that make sense? So if somebody is so good at decoding, or they just have everything memorized, they read so much, we don't know if they really know the multisyllabic syllables. Right? We don't know if they know that. The reason is because they get the items right. But when we have a fake word like maternesty, that's not a real word. You're going to have to sound it out if you want to hear maternesty and actually click on the right item. So uh, on some of the sheets, when we look at it, you'll see it, we give a little tally of the errors. It's interesting. In testing, sometimes it's not so interesting what they get right. It's actually sometimes more interesting what they get wrong. We call that miscue analysis, is when we look at the wrong answers. All right, next one is phonemic awareness. This is K2. All K2 students get phonemic awareness. If they're not, if they're above grade two, then they only get uh, phonemic awareness if their score is low in decoding, okay? And this one is pure auditory. So it's cat. What is the middle sound in the word cat? And then they hear three, four sounds. Ah, ah, uh, maybe tss, right? So this one too, though, just be aware, it is a short subtest within Dora. So it has, it's really, we consider this a screener within Dora. So if somebody does show up low, doesn't necessarily mean they're low, but um, it does give you an indi you know, indication of their phonemic awareness skills. Now, if, if you really suspect somebody has a phonemic awareness issue, meaning, you know, I don't know if you realize, but uh, that's an auditory issue, where some people cannot tell you. If you say, what's the middle sound in the word cat? Their brain cannot pull that sound out. They just can't, right? No matter how, you know, cat, they just cannot pull out the ah out of that. And that's just the way some people are wired. If you suspect that, we do have a standalone phonemic awareness test that everyone has access to. And you could assess a student on that. And that's full standalone, takes 30, 40 minutes, but it rigorously goes through everything and there's an example question for each task. And the reason why so that's good to know is if you suspect a student has phonemic awareness issues, then your normal instruction has to change. They may not be able to learn phonics. They may need to be just a sight word reader, right? Okay. All right, next one is oral vocabulary. So oral vocabulary is uh, you're, they're going to hear a word and if they click on the picture, they hear. So this could be ascend. Now it is oral vocabulary, right? So not, not everyone was always aware that Dora tests oral vocabulary. It's not written. It goes from K through high 12. The next one is spelling. And, and feel free to chime up. If you have questions about these subtests, you know, feel free to ask. Spelling is uh, in context. So you'll hear something like uh, book. I'm reading my favorite book. Book. Now, these, the target words are also regular and irregular words. So for somebody to get a higher score or a grade level score, they actually have to have exposure to print or uh, reading. It could be, uh, you know, iPads. So that's sort of interesting. If you're trying to figure out someone's scores, you have a student and their scores are, you know, medium high and you're trying to figure out what's going on, you say, do they read a lot? Well, if you see a medium or high score in spelling, then you know they must read because that's the only way to get a score that's higher is by being exposed. Is it T-I-O-N or S-I-O-N? Is it P-H or F? Does that part make sense? Okay, so it is interesting. I'll see some students, I know yesterday I was looking at some teacher's class, but one student who was fourth grade, he had a 10th grade spelling score. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you know, that is really impressive. I mean, those, some of those 10th grade words are really hard to spell. I wouldn't want to take that myself, actually. All right, reading comprehension. So now we're getting into the interesting one. So this is what's interesting about reading comprehension. There's no grand unified theory of what is reading comprehension. Reading comprehension could be um, reading some instructions and putting together some kit from a IKEA, right? 
Reading comprehension could be um, reading a paragraph. It could be reading a, a book. So we had to put the stake in the ground when we designed Dora. We said, okay, what is the kind of reading comprehension that is interesting to us that's going to help us determine long-term success with students in school? Our opinion, and some other people agree with us, is that it's, can students be successful in content reading? Can I read two chapters of history, of science, of biology, um, and actually come back to school and discuss it with my peers, write a paper on it, and so on and so forth. In college, right, we talk about college readiness with, with Common Core. Well, what do you do in college? You read case studies, you do an analysis. You, you, know, you, you read several different sources, and then you actually have to bring it together and come up with a, your own thesis. In order to do that, you have to process the information. So that's why we don't allow look back. Now, there's lots of testing that allows look back, right? Now, the only thing I'd say about state testing is um, they're also timed, right? So when something is timed, it does change it. So you don't have all the time in the world to, to look at the questions and go back. Um, you know, you still have to, you want to still process what you're reading. So, so we did put the stake in the ground. This is an untimed test. So students have to read it, and then they hit done, and then they answer the questions. Again, we're not trying to be predictive of the state test, although technically, DORA scores are predictive. I mean, there is a correlation with state testing scores and DORA. If they can be successful in DORA, then it's a higher uh, probability they'll be successful in your state test. Okay? But what we're telling you is, you know, when you see a student with a high DORA score, comprehension score, that tells you a lot. Because that means that they've been able to read it. And also the stories get longer as we go up higher in, pa in um, grade level. So all the passages are leveled through standard uh, text leveling system, which is Lexile and Flesh Kincaid. It looks at number of words per sentence and number of syllables per word. That's pretty standard in the industry. That's how you level text. Okay? And, and, and then what we also make the passages get longer. So when you go up to a 12th grade passage, it's a pretty long passage. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay, so now when you, you know, when you read, when you see those scores, for someone to get Let's say a fifth grader has an eighth grade score. That's a pretty significant score. They can't just uh, trick the system into getting an eighth grade score. They actually have to go through multiple passages. And also, the way we determine it is their decoding scores determine their starting passage level. So the students who struggle with reading, probably they're starting at lower passages. And then if they do get a higher score, they actually have to work their way up. Now, later on, when someone does a second or third testing of DORA and looks at their old scores, and then it starts them at higher levels if they're high. So uh, subsequent testings will be more efficient. So there was a student who was 12th grade. I think he was a sixth grader. But he had tested 12th grade previously. So when we did the post-testing, he started at 12th grade. And he ended up having mastery of that passage. And so he had one passage. And then he was done. Okay. All right, questions about comprehension? Because this is a really interesting measure. So I want to make sure we, we vet everything out. And, and I guess, again, it depends on what are you trying to test. Like, for some reason, uh, in that case, they're testing very specific skills. Like, can they go ahead and research and find the main idea, right? So go back in the passage and find, under, find the, the sentence that, you know, uh, best represents the main idea of this passage. That, they're testing a very specific skill. What we're testing initially is, what is the student's reading level? Because what you're trying to do is to, for your group instruction, you want to say, I have a group of fifth graders. Do I need to work on comprehension strategies with this group of students? Or should I work on decoding? Or do I need to work on vocabulary? So we're trying to help you break the students into specific groups. We're not trying to specifically tell you which strategy they know or don't know. Part of it is DORA is too short of assessment to do that. Right? We're, we're trying to do all of reading. So in an hour, you know, you can't break out some of the comprehension strategy skills. But what we can tell you, if you have a fifth grader and they're reading at a seventh grade level, I would argue they don't need comprehension strategies work. They're good. They can figure out main idea. They can figure out inferencing. They can figure out author's purpose prediction. Basically, they can read a passage and get information, answer questions correctly about it. To me, that tells me they don't need that. So then I may work with writing with that student. Or 
if it turns out their vocabulary is low, maybe I focus on vocabulary. So you're gonna find out in your school, a lot of students have low vocabulary. Okay, so here's another thing I didn't point out is, let um, me actually go to the next screen here. Yes. They, 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 wouldn't, they wouldn't be given a pass. Let's say, so if you have a first grader and they're going to have, let's say they have first grade decoding, you know, they're yeah, they on grade. Really care what comes up. So the student would get a first grade. A first grade passage is one screen. Right. Okay, it's not multiple screens. Um, if somebody did have a higher passage, it's because they have higher decoding, higher vocabulary, and they started on something higher. But um, you know what? This is the task. This is reading. Right. I know it's a hard task, but and maybe at first grade, some of those students are going to have a challenge, but it gives you a bit, if they can do this, then you know that that student is going to be stronger for content reading. I mean, and some of it can be exposure. At the first grade, I, I agree, at the very, very beginning, if they just haven't been exposed to it, then they may have a harder time because of the task. And maybe you, you argue, well, you know what? This is just a shock to them at first grade to be in the year, and it's not as accurate. But ultimately, they have to do this. And, and, right, and, and our goal for Dora, is to inform you on how are students going to be successful in reading. And, and you, you know, you could have pictures, you could have other things, but that's, that's not necessarily reading, right? I mean, that is reading, but there's, it's a, it's a lower level reading. And so we want to know what can they do. And, and so again, this is a little bit more rigorous. I would argue that if you had that first grader who does have a high score, you don't probably need to have them in that reading group where you're working on comprehensive strategies, you know? So at least it does, it does tell you who, a certain task. And, and, and like I said, you have to be the judge of that. And those are great things to bring up. Right. But, it, but hopefully that, make, you know, I mean, that makes sense, all right? So you sort of see the bias of this test. And then, like I said, again, when you see someone who is successful, it should help shape which students you put into your small groups, right? Do you see that? Okay, so the only thing I'd argue is that, you know, the thing about students when you're teaching them the comprehension skills is that, yes, they can use a lot of those skills, right? I mean, and sometimes they can't use it in certain circumstances. If the, photo, if the book has no pictures, obviously they can't use it. But there's still comprehension strategy skills they could use when they're reading the passage, right? I mean, there's a lot that we teach them just to use within the text, right? So, so I, I, you know, hopefully they're, they're learning lots of skills and then they, and they need to be learned, taught, <coughs> excuse me, how to use those skills in certain circumstances. So um, I guess, you know, it, it is, in that sense, it is probably considered harder. It is harder text. But again, you know, that's, that's the diagnostic nature of DORA. And, and we could take a look at your class in a little bit. I think, you know, it does, it does start separating some students and maybe arguably it's too hard. You know, but if you have a second grade class, then maybe what you feel is if they have a first grade score, then in that particular case, that's really good for those students. So maybe it's a matter of you're adjusting your, your expectations for your grade level score. So one other thing I have to point out I forgot to mention is our passages also do not have high grade level vocabulary embedded in them. So uh, this is an interesting story. So I had a school district call me, it's probably like 10 years ago, um, <laughs> from Canada. And they said, uh, there's something wrong with Dora. We've tested all these students and they have an eighth or ninth grade score on DORA on comprehension, but we gave them the SRI, Scholastic Reading Inventory, and their Lexile came out to be about third and fourth grade. So I said, that's really unusual. I said, can I take a look at your student data? And they said, sure. So I log in, I look at their account, and all of the students' names were Chinese. So I'm like, Chinese? How come all your kids are Chinese? I said, you're in Canada, is that correct? And they said, yes. They said, these are exchange students from Hong Kong. Okay. So what do you think about exchange students from Hong Kong? What can we say about uh, kids who were flown over for the summer to Canada? Do you think they're affluent, not affluent? They're affluent. Okay. They, they probably go to school from 7 or 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. at night, right? A lot of students in Hong Kong, they go to school. After school, they go to private tutors until 6 or 7 o'clock. 
So these kids are very bright. They had very strong comprehension strategy skills. But what happened was most passages, they're really a combo vocabulary comprehension strategy test. The lower of the skill, lower vocabulary or lower comprehension strategy is your score. So if you're low here, your score is there. If you're low in this one, your score is here. So these students didn't have good vocabulary. So in our passages, we write them without embedding high vocabulary. Okay. So we will not do something like this. The eloquent man gave a speech, blah, 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 blah. And the question is, did the audience think he spoke well? Right? I'd have to know the definition of eloquent in order to get that right. right. Unless there was some kind of inferencing telling me that. So we don't do pure vocabulary testing inside of our passages because we want to tease out those EL students or those low socioeconomic students who have low academic vocabulary and we want to make sure they're not misdiagnosed as poor readers when it's purely vocabulary. Now do you think you have students like that at your school? Who maybe they're good readers, good comprehension strategies, but they're just low in vocabulary? Okay. The data indicates in Jersey City it's huge. Right? A lot of schools, the biggest, if you look at all the groups of, of people who are struggling, students struggling with reading in um, you know, sixth grade and above, half of them are just pure. They actually understand comprehensive strategies. They're good at figuring meaning out, but they're just low vac academic vocabulary. So their vocabulary is so low, it actually hurts them on the state test. It hurt, it's going to hurt them on the SAT. You know, the SAT is so vocabulary biased, right? My son is, is um, junior now, so he's taking the SAT, and I started looking at the materials and the practice test. It is crazy. It is so biased. I mean, I, I don't know how they expect, you know, students to know all that vocabulary, which is really unfortunate. So, because the SAT or the ACT are basically a huge indicator of, of who gets into colleges or in which colleges you get into. And, you know, Personally, I don't think vocabulary is necessarily a link, you know, of what you can do. That, you know, that's the, your vocabulary is your background, right? And if you're, you learned it at home. So anyway, with that said, this is something that's really unique about DORA. We can tease out that vocabulary score. And we're going to take a look at it in a second. And it's going to be interesting because we have your data for your school and for the district. Okay, so the biases. Comprehension in general. Because of the longer passages, nonfiction, no look back, you could say that our scores can be pushed a little bit lower. I say there's definitely a bias. You're going to have students with lower scores. But because of the lack of dependency on vocabulary, you're going to see some students who the score goes up. So there's two things, depending on the student. Right? Word recognition, it's words out of context. You see uh, by fourth, fifth, fifth, sixth grade, it'll shoot up. Spelling tends to be lower just because overall all students in the United States, just spelling is becoming a little bit of a lost skill. Um, oral vocabulary among young students, you can sort of see it up. It'll shoot up early because oral vocabulary skills can go up easily when students are young. But then it, it levels off and then actually ends up being lower as they get older. Okay? Does that make sense? So these are the things to keep in mind with DORA. Um, it's not necessarily a negative thing, I don't think. It's just that's the nature of any test. You take the Parks test, you take anything, you, you're going to have a whole bunch of things like this. The other thing is I know the Parks too, there's keyboarding skills, right? You actually have to write sometimes, which if students have a hard time with a QWERTY keyboard, that makes up, that's a bias too. They take too long to, to type. Who has a class that we can actually look at, a volunteer? So let's just look, actually we'll look at this example I have here in our hands first. You know, it's one thing is the phonics, it, it points out the percent of errors, 25% were real words, 75% were non-words. So we look at all of the wrong answers and we, we tally it up and we do a percentage. So that sort of gives you an idea. I don't know if it means so much for a younger student, but like I said, as the students get older and their, high, their word recognition skills, it is interesting to note that. Um, the other thing the student is, is you know, high frequency words, word rec, they're all sort of within grade level or vocabulary. So really it's just a comprehension strategies for this one student. Okay, so actually if we look at this class, we see one thing I want to point out too is when students have a zero spelling and a zero comprehension, that means they were not given a spelling or a 
the comprehension subtest because if they don't even have the very, very beginning of high frequency words, it doesn't turn on. Right? And that's part of that is because it would be too frustrating for them. If they don't know their first level of sight words like and, a, of, then they're going to have a real hard time reading a passage. Right? So then we, we turn that off. Yeah, you have, you have a, and this is first grade. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, they're beginning readers. They're emergent readers, most of your students in your class. Interesting. Okay. Sometimes, like I said, kindergarten or first grade classes, if they're all sort of emergent, it's not quite as always as interesting to look at just because you sort of know what you need to do, right? But then you do sort of pick out some of those, those students who are outliers. So we look at B. So most of your students are falling into B, which is they need to work on decoding, they need to work on comprehensive strategies, their vocabulary is good. This, in this sense, it's very simple for you. You're working on decoding probably first. The comprehension, they're low because they haven't even read the passage, right? So, so most of them, you're working on decoding sight words, phonics, and once that shoots up, then that's going to help their comprehension. Let's take a look at, um, does anyone else have like a second or third grade class or a fourth? Okay, and what's your name? All right, so you see, yes, quite a range. This student here, second grader, they've nailed down the coding, right? Maxed out, 3.83 and, and high frequency words, maxed out on phonics. They're such a good decoder, as I mentioned, the, the scores go up. Third grade comprehension, oral vocabulary is around third grade, spelling is around third grade. They're above. Okay. So she's an independent reader, right? And so I would, like I said again, in that student like that, they're, if they're reading on their own, having a third grade score right there too, that tells me that she reads for spelling, sorry. So she must read on her own because there's no way to get it. It's very hard to get a third grade score. You can't just have good phonics and get a good spelling score. So I would say if that student is reading on their own, I'm not ever going to waste my time with comprehensive strategies, right, with that student. Um, I don't need to go over you know, all this, they automatically they figured it out. Now some other students here, this one, second grade student, you know, they're right on the cusp in terms of, of decoding. They got the second grade uh, uh, high frequency words, the word rack is a little low, right? Could be a little bit higher, not bad, but they clearly they've worked on the, the sight words because that's something that you have to work on to master. And phonics is sort of keeping track. If we wonder what 2.17 is, we can click on this, and 2.17, it's about right here. So they're working next on long vowel, right? They've mastered sort of short vowel consonant blends, so they're working on long vowel or silent E rule. Okay, and comprehension, probably, you know, that might be something that pops once their decoding gets a little further along, but you also probably need to work on comprehensive strategies. So in this group, it, the definitions, you know, we're saying whether students are they're on grade or above, right? It, it's, it's, there's sort of a, a window. Um, so most of the students actually are falling within grade, which is within a year, plus or minus. But then you have a few students here, B and C. Is there anyone in particular you want to take a look at? Do you have, what about a student you suspect their score is too low on the comprehension? A passage or spelling, but she, she had a .5, which is the lowest score on sight words. So she didn't even master the first set. Okay, remember, it's not just an item. It would be at least eight items. She had a non-mastery on those eight items. So it could be that she just got six out of eight correct, and she needed seven. So, but if she didn't get enough or if she wasn't going fast enough. But then again, under regular word rec, which is untimed, she had a .5 score too. So I would sometimes suspect it, let's say they had a .5 there, but then they had a, you know, something higher in word rec. You could say, oh, maybe they didn't, they just didn't know it was timed. But because both are low, according to phonics one right here, she's at .83, which is beginning sounds. Does that make sense? That she, she yeah, she's, she's, um, <coughs> Okay, yeah. And I think even with her, I, I'm not sure because, you know, something clicked when you said maybe some students, they cannot even identify. So the only thing I would say that goes against that is look at the uh, phonemic awareness score, 0.67. Mm -hmm. That's actually, it's actually hard to get a 0.67. The task is pretty difficult um, because they have all these things like take the word pat, change p 
to t what's the word, you, you know, whatever. And then what's the middle sound on the word cat? You know, there's a lot of hard tasks. Every single item is a different task. Um, so to get a 0.67 is actually pretty tough. But she does have a 0.83. You're right, that's low. And it, it's, so it's hard to say, you know, all students are different. And if they did have a, some kind of issue with learning phonics, it's hard because then they lose that whole technique for sounding out words, right? If you don't have phonics, what do you have? You have to memorize everything. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. But he only has a third grade vocabulary, so if you gave him a pure sixth grade text, you know, he, he might have a hard time actually getting that high because his vocabulary is going to limit him. So if he read something in social studies at sixth grade, the vocabulary may be so hard that he probably won't comprehend. But in this, he can actually read long sentences, lots of clauses. He can read a long passage. So that's, that's good to know. That's a good skill, right? Um, second grade. Let's see. So again, that's a student who I wouldn't worry about comprehension strategies technique. You know, I would say, okay, they've got it nailed down. But I would worry about that vocabulary uh, because, I mean, not necessarily now, but here's the problem with vocabulary is overall in your district and for most students in, in similar districts, their vocabulary is around third, fourth, fifth, and then it starts leveling off and then it doesn't go up, okay? Then it goes up maybe a half a year a year. So by the time they're in eighth grade, they're fifth grade or fifth, five and a half. So the problem is that vocabulary is something that, it, you know, it sort of will level off because usually in a household, let's say it's uh, your English, if it's English as a second language, or your social economic level, a certain level, maybe you're speaking third, fourth grade vocabulary. Most people, that's what we do, right? We're not, we're not using, you know, come on, daughter, be tenacious, finish your dinner. I mean, you know, you're not, you're not talking like that. You're like, you know, eat it. <laughs> Go to your room. <laughs> All right, so here's another interesting test uh, I want to show you, or a test report. We go to the Manage tab. And we say run reports. And we're going to go to the one called DORA Comprehension Subtest Analysis. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and put in a date range. Okay. So this, a red score indicates potentially the student didn't read the questions. It means uh, the reading time is in minutes and the, the question times in seconds. So let's take a look at these students here. Sorry, this is a little tiny, right? I mean, the screen, actually I could zoom out. Okay, all right, there we go. All right, um, actually it looks like everyone tried. So the, Santana is right here, yeah. If we look at her, we see that, oh, him, okay, sorry. Level five, he spent five minutes reading at 0.9. Actually, I'll just use the mouse. It's easier because I can't. So he spent five minutes reading the level five passage. He spent an average of 16 seconds per question, and he got 100%. He had all six questions right. Does it sound right? No, five minutes. Five minutes. But the, reading, but the questions, I mean, 16 seconds to read questions and the, all the answers, that's pretty fast. Yeah, but so, but then, you know, let's look at it. On the level three, he spent four minutes, 16, he got 100. Okay, and here, this one, not, not available. Sometimes if somebody walks away or they come back, you know, we don't, suddenly the time will say like 20 minutes. That's not right, so we just say not available because we know it's not accurate. Yeah, that's what happened. He had to come back and finish it. Okay, yeah, so sometimes if there's something strange like that, then we'll just put NA if we suspect. But 14 seconds, 15 seconds, and he got 70%. I don't know. This to me, and then he went up to the seventh grade level. He spent six minutes reading it, and he spent an average of 10, and then he only got 50% 50% right. I would argue that that's consistent. Boom, boom, boom. Three passages consistently getting a good score. I'd say the student has good comprehension strategy skills, that they can actually read a hard passage like Dora. It's hard, right? No look back. Nonfiction, longer. The six, fifth and sixth grade passages are definitely two or three screens. They're long by the time you get up there. Um, somehow he, he's doing it, you know? He's got de good decoding skills too, right? Yes. But again, remember, 
doesn't have a high vocabulary in it, right? But now we pure know, okay, this does tell us something about his ability. A lot, of, I tell you, it's interesting, the school in LA, they were using their state test, like NJ asked to do cut off and determine students go into intervention, which is real common. We, re -te we tested all those students who were put into intervention, and probably about 30% shouldn't have been, because they were G students. They were the students who had the high comprehension strategy, but it was just low academic vocabulary. But they were having them put into pure reading intervention, which, you know, they were using like Read 180 or something like that, which isn't necessarily correct for those students. They needed vocabulary. All right. So it's just something to keep in mind. A lot of students we put into the wrong interventions because we just think they're poor readers, but it's not reading. It's vocabulary. It, but it manifests itself as reading, right? Yes? They took longer time to read. Yeah. So it finally caught up on them in the next so, the, so there's a couple things. So this is what we have to sort of look at this. If somebody, maybe you did it in two sessions, it's also possible, or maybe sometimes students log themselves out. If they do log themselves out, then they log themselves back in, and then they, they read the passage quickly and they hit done. So then the timer restarts. So if it's so when somebody starts spanning multiple sessions, then there could be some inaccuracies. Right? Again, you know, it, it's it's hard to say exactly what's going on just because of the way it works. So so there are times where it could be off. But you know what, the first grade passages, sometimes they are sort of low. This is a second grade class. It's about the warm sun or something like that. There's, you know, I think there's the zoo, right? There are passages sometimes kids could figure out, right? And again, that's the bias of any comprehension test. If the student, if you know the passage, you know the topic, then you're going to do well on it. But again, you got 80%, you got 70%, and then here, okay, so it, actually maybe it is. Look at this, 40, only, only half a minute. This student maybe doesn't, isn't taking their time to read, potentially. Do you think the score, they got a 2.17? Does that sound accurate for Bruce? Could it be higher? Yeah. Yeah, it could be. I mean, they did, clearly they tried right here, but if they didn't really read the passage, if that is accurate and they only spent 30 seconds reading the passage, then I'm not surprised that they take six, you know, 15, 16 seconds per question and only get 20%. So the questions are, half of them are inferential, half are factual. Half of them, they're going to have to pick up some information out and the other half are going to be something that they have to infer from the passage. Right. Okay. All right, so is that an interesting report, you think? <laughs>